Hey folks, it's Yannick Guzdala. It's the Yannick Guzdala podcast. Pretty obvious where we're starting this week's episode at. If you're watching on YouTube, you're about to be seeing this beautiful P-Base from RKM Bases in Mexico. Kind of road-worn, custom shop, whatever you want to call it. Um, have all the specs up. So for all the spec nerds out there that uh, inevitably, inevitably going to pour into the comments with what this instrument is, actually, I should probably not talk about them and then have tons of people ask questions in the comments about it and boost the algorithm. But no, I'm going to be, I'm going to be nice. I'm not going to be a prick about it. Let's go. It's uh, a mahogany body, a satin polyurethane road worn finish, as is evidenced by. Well, you can see what's going on here. In the camera. If you're not if you're not watching on YouTube, go ahead and uh, come check it out. This is a beautiful instrument. Um, body shape is the RKM Modern Precision Bass Four. It's RKM's tape take on the P bass. Uh, the neck is hard rock maple. Um, by the way, I'm just reading stuff off their website right now for this exact bass. I don't know what most of these things mean. So, but I know a lot of you out there do know and want to know. Uh, let's see, neck finish is that satin polyurethane road worn thing again. Neck shape is a modern fat custom RKM neck. We'll talk about what the neck is in a little while. I'm not really sure. It's a cross between a P and a J, I guess. What, whatever it is, it's freaking amazing. Um, probably the thing I connected with like instantly. That was like the instant connection with the instrument. That's why it's sitting in my hands right now. Uh, neck reinforcement, carbon fiber, fingerboard material, bird's eye maple, fingerboard radius uh i gotta move the browser over here try using the right mouse quiz uh fingerboard compound radius 16 to 20 i n i don't know what that means uh let's skip that one <laughs> number of frets 22 so it goes up to an f natural which is super nice fret size vintage narrow fret wire i really like the way the frets um feel The nut material, it actually says brass on the nut on here, but I know it's not because it's white. So I'm not sure what that actually is. Could be a bunch of things from plastic to like mammoth bone or something. And uh, what else do we have on the specs here? I guess the pickups, electronics. Yeah, electronics bridge pickup is a Fralin P base. They're bridge and neck pickup. So it's a double P, two sets of P uh, of P's right here. Um, they're by Fralin or Fralin. Don't know that company, but they feel great. The preamp is a Sadowski four knob WVTC nine volt. And the controls are volume, blend, active, passive. Oh, yeah, it has a pull pot for active, uh, passive. Where is it? There it is. And treble and bass. Knew that. The hardware is hip shot. Um, yeah, machine. There was all hip shot. Very nice miscellaneous miscellaneous don't need to know any of that okay so that's the specs out of the way that's the nerdy bit um i'll throw some of that in the description as well just so you can go back and decipher exactly what it is for yourself let's let's hear the bass uh well how do i have it set up right now I have it on the back pickups only full tone a tiny bit of bass i think but there's no center notch on the on that pot so i'm not sure Um, full volume it just feels so freaking good what is it that i think the thing i figured out even at the nam show which is where i met these guys beautiful cats from uh, from rkm um that's where i met these guys where i played the bass the first time i was just walk casually walking by a different bass the look of a different bass the green one that was on the booth caught my eye and uh, I stopped by. I was checking it out. There was some short scale things. There was a fret list. There was a bunch of stuff. I was like, oh, this is interesting. Got talking to the cats and eventually sat down and played this one first, this blue one. And that was it. I even tried the green one. I tried a bunch of others. But there was something about that first impression, that instant connection that you sometimes get with an instrument. Maybe you've experienced that before. Um, you know what I'm talking about. That just that was it, you know. And, and when finally when they were sweet enough to say, hey, do you want to take one of these with you? Do you want one of these instruments? Um, I was first of all blown away and very flattered. And they were saying maybe actually the green one is is better in this respect and that respect and blah blah blah. And I it was really this blue one that I stuck with and they were slightly different bases. It wasn't that they were the same bass and one was better than the other. Just the feel of this one and I think the maple neck. I've always liked maple necks on a P bass. Um, was just an instant vibe for me. Before we get into more playing uh, 
and, and all the rest of it about the base. And I've, there's so much to talk about, NAM, recap, and all kinds of things that happen. I have to tell you that just literally just in today, as I record this on a Sunday, a ton of physical books just came back into stock today. Pentatonics, which sells out immediately. I'm sorry, I wish... I had the capital up front just to buy like a thousand copies and have them in the house. I don't. So I buy them 10, 20 at a time. They sell out. I buy more. So I'm going to keep doing that. Um, there will be, there is a waiting list if it's sold out and you, and you and you put your email in, you can get notified when it comes back in stock. Maybe you've already seen that. But as of today, there are Pentatonics, 251s, Altered, Warm Up, Iconic Lines, Sight Reading and Chordal Harmony Volume 1 back in stock. Uh, so I just wanted to tell you that. Um, give a quick plug to the books and they are shipping worldwide if you're outside of the u.s make sure you're on the international shipping page a few people have been saying hey man i wish you shipped to you know slovenia or the uk or australia we ship everywhere you just have to be on the right page on the website it's all linked below in the description of the video if you're watching on youtube or it's in the show notes if you're listening elsewhere so where do I start with this base? And also, it's the irony is not lost on me that not three or four months ago, I was sitting here making a video saying I'm selling all my bases. I'm sure that's your first instinct. If you haven't already, if you haven't like just paused the video and commented, hey, man, I thought you were selling all your shit. If you haven't done that already, um, here's the explanation with that. I did sell a crap ton of bases, a lot of things left. Um and rightly so. And a lot of quite sentimental things, actually, because I'd played them in, you know, the situations that meant a lot to me. But the reality of the situation was they just weren't getting played. And uh, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to strip things down because I wanted more space, number one. Um, and having, like, it's ridiculous, having 25, 30 bases or something for me at my age, at based on what I do as a bass player you know I, I said I've said before I'm not the Lee Sklar or the Sean Hurley although actually now I reference those guys I think Lee Sklar plays that Frankenstein bass in his dingwall so much let's say that's only two instruments and I'm pretty sure Sean Hurley plays most often his kind of signature um, Fender P bass thing so but those are the kind of guys who are in the kinds of positions where they will take so many instruments to a studio session because that's what they do every single day of the week and that's their that's their lives that's their career and that's just not what I do as a bass player so that was getting rid of all of those bases was a lot to do with that it was a lot to do with sort of facing reality understanding that I want less clutter and I want more space maybe some more space for some pedals I've since sorted all my pedals out since the flood and it's been nice to have them out there and really see them all and I'm using them more and preparing videos for you guys for the pedal studio series um, so yeah that was what that was about and then after I got rid of them it wasn't like I was really missing anything, but I did feel like I had, I thought to myself, oh, if something were to come up, um, maybe if I had a custom instrument built or something, there would now be the space for it. And there would be the space to have sort of one of something. And of course I have a Fender P bass and I got rid of a few P basses and I got rid of the Mustang and I got rid of the uh, Music Master. I got rid of a bunch of four strings, a bunch of Fenders. But when this came along when this double p came along that is a little unique it's like my kind of as unique as my mattis and triple p in that sense is it does something quite specific um and it really felt like okay now i have space to have something unique like this in the house something very specific double p i don't have that on any other instrument um so it's, it sort of feels nice like i'm not getting 20 more bases to replace all the ones that left but out of i don't know what i so like 12 or 13 instruments or something like that maybe two or three two or three over the next year will come in and um, they'll come in for a good reason and they'll be on a tight leash and I'll keep I'll sort of monitor myself as to how much I'm using them and and how much like joy it brings me to walk in the studio and see them and pick them up and play them and see what happens you know and uh, not be afraid of getting rid of them if I have to so so as far as an instrument like this it's really kind of interesting I'm gonna take one ear off of the headphones here it's 
still getting used to it, obviously. I've probably played no more than about three or four hours on this instrument total, which is, you know, not not a lot, of course, compared to all of my other instruments. And I should point out, you know, one of the stats that wasn't in that list that I rattled off at the top of the episode was the string spacing. That was not in the list of specs on the website, but for sure, it's definitely not 16.5 like I'm used to. Uh, that's that is absolutely for real. Um, it's it's quite wide. It's more typical of a Fender. I'm gonna say maybe 18. I don't think it's like bombastic, like 19 or 20. I don't think I'd be able to play half of the things I'm able to right now if it was that wide. Um, not without a lot of practice. So I think it's probably somewhere in the 18 millimeter range. I'll report back to you soon on that. Uh. But I'm kind of flexible on it. It's not, um, it's a little weirder angle today. As I'm looking at the monitor here and the camera's rolling back and forth, you guys are a little bit below me today. Uh, but I figured this would be the best way to get a close-up and give you guys a look. Slightly thinner headstock, for instance. That's a pretty unique shape on it. Don't see that too often. But yeah, the best angle to give you guys a look at what's going on here with the instrument and a close-up of, of all the good stuff, all the, the pickups, the control layout, and kind of how, how I'm doing... How I'm able to play some of my kind of my vocabulary, my voice on an instrument that's very unfamiliar to me, and that was one of the big things that I connected um, with the instrument of right away was that oh okay I'm right there, it's I'm like sort of millimeters away from fully being comfortable with a new instrument, which is very rare. I think that was the thing that stood out the most to me. <laughs> The stretches are a little, obviously a little bit more. It's a 34-inch scale. I'm really used to playing a 32 now. So between the scale and the string spacing, those are probably the two things that are a little bit, um, that will take a little bit of getting used to. I'm not sure if it's something I want to change and make the string spacing a little narrower at, um, by adjusting the bridge. I don't know whether I would customize the nut potentially to do that. I, I'm not sure. Um, it's, it's one of those things like, maybe just take it at face value and use it for what it's great for. And I think it gives, yes, it's a double P, and I think it gives maybe an option. I felt it was a little more jazz-like, jazz bass like when I picked it up for being a double P, like a double dosage of P should not equal J, <laughs> for instance. But it, it really kind of did. It gave me that little bit of versatility. I was, I broke all my rules. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> You know, I even slapped it a little bit. The maple neck, I couldn't resist. I knew if everything was set up the right way, it would probably sound like a little bit like Marcus Miller. Uh, that my EQ is not set up the right way for that sound right now, but. Um, I couldn't resist playing some of those whenever I see a maple neck sort of Fender style bass. Uh, I, you know. As much as I'm not the slap guy and I don't just go out and copy Marcus Miller, and he's, he's obviously a massive hero of mine. I'm a like super fan. Um, it's a tragedy that, uh, um, what is it, Tales, his record Tales. It's a tragedy that that's not on streaming platforms because I, I just wish more people knew about that record and knew about his fretless playing and just knew about the writing on that record and the fact that Michelle and Degas cellos on it. And it just, you know, some of the bass clarinet playing on there for me is like some of the best he's ever done on record. So it, there was a definite moment of nostalgia when I just play, I play, you know, a couple of slap notes. I was like, oh man, I've, you know, 
I really listened to a lot of Marcus uh, back in the day and was a, have always just been a, a massive fan of his. So that kind of brought me to that uh, feeling a little bit, which was really nice. Um, I Also, like aesthetically, I just dig the instrument. By the way, I, I should have prefaced this. Like RKM are not like there's no sponsorship deal. They're not paying me to say any of this. Yes, they gave, they were super kind to gift me the bass. That's huge. I, I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, in this episode and about the where I'm at in my life and in my career and how certain opportunities have opened up and why they've opened up and and how special that is to me and how much I I don't take any of it for fuck it let's talk about it now actually because I don't take any of that stuff for granted it's really a unique situation that I find myself in I don't walk onto the floor of the NAM show and just expect to be handed stuff I was I I only went for a few hours because I've really it's very much a love-hate relationship with that entire thing. And for the most part, it's a whole bunch of waffle and attention-grabbing nonsense, you know, and people are going there specifically to do that. You know, they're going to trade in the currency of attention. And they're going to go on the booth. And they, they there are certain musicians, certain very well-known musicians that I'm sure you've all heard or seen on youtube or tiktok that, that that's basically what their entire setup is that's how they play all of the time and it's just you know you go to the nam show and you see and you hear that up front and in person you're like oh my god like this is what i hate about this show because it's just absolutely like pedal to the floor flat out loud and as fast and as stupid as you possibly can, you know, very little music going on for the most part. There's some exceptions, of course. Um, so for many years, I've avoided just, you know, trying to play in public basically at a show like that because it's, it's pretty pointless. Um, but then this show, um, first time I've been in, in many years, you know, since since 2000s, four years, you know, pandemic. I never went to any of the, the, the NAMM shows since since the beginning of 2000, oh, the 2000, since the beginning of 2020. Um, and it was a very different experience and something, you know, I had no idea I was going to be walking out there with instruments or with pedals or not even any uh, physical uh, things, but just without, I, I didn't realize I was going to be walking out of there with new relationships and new and, and meeting people for the first time and actually seeing them face to face and getting a chance to do that because they live in a, in a, you know, in a country really far away, for instance, that I don't get to visit all the time. Or they live in a country I go to all the time, but they live in the countryside and I don't get to go where they live. So it was for that, I was very, very appreciative. And I'm actually really happy I went, even though it was just one day I went on the first day, the Thursday, and I only went for a few hours. And my uh, my low-end buffer was basically full by two o'clock. And I was like, all right, I can't take this anymore. It's just too much. <laughs> it really is actually that sound. <laughs> Sounds like a really bad sample from a sci-fi movie, just constantly wherever, wherever you walk. And occasionally the thing will stick out. It's normally a slap note or a screaming guitar note will just stick out of the noise and you'll leap to one side shocked uh but yeah it's 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 kind of a cacophony it's a chaotic mess but met so many awesome people I met a bunch of fans as well coffee drinkers and people who listen to podcasts and follow the channel and listen to my music so that's always beautiful it's always nice to talk to people about music um nice that there's still an element of that at the nam show and yeah so not taking I don't take any of that, the free gear, the swag, as it were, for granted. And it's not like this is like a T-shirt or a baseball cap. This is a fucking bass. And it's a beautiful bass as well. And it was uh, an unbelievably kind gift. Yeah, and of course, I'm going to talk about it. Maybe you guys are going to dig it as well. Like you dig my playing, you dig the the music, and maybe you're going to go order one from them. So it's, it, of course, it 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 works out. I understand why this happens, but it was just nice that behind all the business and all the, all the chaos and the bullshit of Nam, they were just really nice people making super, superb and superior instruments. And I happened to connect with one. And the fact that I got to take it home was just totally bonkers to me. Even at this stage of having had dozens upon dozens of free instruments in my life, I have never taken that shit for granted and never will either. It's just a, a beautiful surprise if it ever happens. 
And it did. It <laughs> happened several times. It just in, in the space of a few hours. And some of the things I can't talk about. Because they're super in the early planning stages. But some... But it did actually make me excited about music. That's the most important thing. Uh, some of these things that I've talked with various, uh, how should we, how should we call it, various companies about, made me excited to look forward to making music with with certain products that may be coming in the not too distant distant future. Um, so yeah, an overall a very positive experience. Managed to see a few old friends as well, which is always nice. I've realized the next day I'd missed like 20 people that I really wanted to see, but the chaos just gets the better of you. And and I think even if I'd gone four days in a row, I could still have said, damn, I wish I'd seen like at least a dozen people that I missed. So that's what the NAMM show can be, uh, can be like. And um, it's, it's changing in a big way. Uh, it's definitely getting smaller and who knows where it goes from here. There are massive companies that do not attend anymore that used to be real mainstays of the entire conference and convention. People like, well, like Yamaha, for instance, they were there, but they used to have uh, an entire separate building like taken over in the Marriott. And now they are in the one room where Fender used to be. Fender don't exhibit anymore, neither the Gibson, neither the PRS, neither the Zildjian, like major, major players in the industry that don't. So it's interesting to see where it's going and who is exhibiting. You know, I was able to have some meetings with some smaller pedal builders, for instance, and just some smaller companies, which was very interesting. So maybe there's scope for that, which would be great, awesome, if, 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 it, if it gets people's stuff out there. Um, gets the world to see great and cool devices and musical instruments and just things that that help the musical process. I'm I'm all for that. So I hope that for the sake of the manufacturers, the builders, and and everyone, that there's something like that that continues. It would be nice if it was. I would like to do some instrument specific things. We always had bass player live. It was in New York for the longest time. Uh, bass day was called back then, bass player live when it came to LA and was at SIR and the key club, but that sort of died of death when bass player magazine got sold off to, uh, well, to my people, to the English that, that basically ended any, uh, any credibility <laughs> that magazine ever have. So that was sad. It used to be a really legit publication that was, uh, that I got a lot out of for many years, but as soon as it left the States, it also sort of, at least the last time I saw it, it seems to have just lost all sort of uh, vision of I don't know, reality or of like the real top end of the music industry. That's that's what it felt like. Anyway, been a long time since I even heard about it or, even, or, or, or saw it in any capacity. So maybe my opinion is super out of date by now. But yeah, there used to be these events and Bass Player Magazine would host Bass Player Live. It was a very cool event for the most part <laughs> it always had some interesting moments but just incredible to get the whole or a large portion of the bass community together and um especially for me as a young bass player in the scene to get to meet you know bass players it's not like maybe there are a couple of guitar players in a band so guitar players will see each other more often there's never two bass players in a band so I would always see bass player friends at the airport, maybe on festivals. That was always a good hang. But when you were just on tour, very rare to see bass players. So to get people, uh, you know, as diverse as like Mike Watt and Abel Boreal and Rocco Prestia and I'm just trying to think, Larry Graham and who else? Like Verdine White and Andrew Goucher and... It was ridiculous. Gary Willis and Victor Wooten and this the who's who of of bass players flea i saw that one year and, and met flea it's like and, and and that was the great thing the green room hang was really like the a mini bass festival in itself there would always be cool instruments there i remember playing donald duck dunn's uh fender bass back in the dressing room and like i just really cool moments that used to happen that doesn't seem to be such a thing anymore um the london bass guitar show Okay, I mean, I I played the very first one in two thousand and eleven, um, 
which we did amazing as far as I remember. I remember the organizers saying, holy shit, we got like thousands of people through the door. Mark King headlined, Gary Willis played, I played, Stu Ham, Lawrence Carter. I mean, it was like a nice lineup, fun hang. Definitely that was a, a, a dressing room, bass player dressing room moment that was super fun. I saw some photographs from that the other day, hanging with, with Gary Willis and uh, Mark King. It's so random. Um, but that doesn't seem to happen so much. It would be really nice to have that in person. Maybe it's more of like, hey, we're going to do a clinic event and it's going to be three bass players, but like three bass players from different generations. I've been toying with this idea. Maybe it would be like, you know, myself and Henrik Linder and John Patitucci. That would be cool with sort of different, three different generations. Bigger gap between me and John age-wise than between me and Henrik. I kind of sit in the middle of that trio, but kind of super different. Uh, in a lot of senses, and John with the upright thing, and Henrik with the more pop and slab thing, and me kind of in the middle with being a jazz musician but playing electric bass. I don't know. That could be a really nice hang, and deliver some value maybe to uh, to people who wanted to attend, like a real event. Rather than you know, clinics are awesome. I went to so many of them. Marcus Miller, Gary Willis, uh, just you know, as ma as many as I possibly could when I was a kid, and they were awesome. And it was you know, sometimes the musicians but they bought their band, which was even better. Um, but maybe a slightly bigger event and have a few people sponsor it, like gear companies like the Yamahas and the Bosses and the Line 6 and maybe some pedal builders, Earthquake or something, I don't know. It would be kind of cool to get to get bass players in one place and experience that. I think I got a massive amount of value from that as a kid and maybe be nice to put on some events like that around the world. So that's kind of on my mind to to do something like that. Maybe leave your feedback, give me some comments below the video. Always welcome. I realize I'm talking a lot and not playing this beautiful instrument. So let's give you guys and girls some idea of different sounds of this thing. So this is all back set. I'll take that. There's no compression, no EQ, no nothing. Everything is totally flat in terms of the signal chain. Ah. And then, see that? <laughs> that's weird. I missed the G natural. That's that's definitely down a little bit to the, to the scale length that I'm not used to. So that's the rear set of P's. This is the front set. Maybe I play exactly the same thing so you can get. Um, so that's the rear. This is the front. And this is both of them right up the middle. I like three sounds like right there. That's with the tone flat out. That's all the way up. So three kind of really usable sounds, at least to my ear anyway, right off the bat. Uh, let's take the tone all the way out, do the same thing again. So rear set. And then all front set. I should say neck and bridge, right? So this is neck. <laughs> More woof with that one, and then center. And then what do we got? Active passives. Whoa, so we get a big uh, leap. It's a big leap down in signal. So the preamp is really bumping, actually. Yeah, the preamp is really bumping. Didn't realize that. So that's a good thing to know. And that's probably why it has so many things becoming very obvious now. That was probably why it was bumping my system uh, a bunch as well. I was like, man, why is the signal so hot? So, okay. Uh, the preamp's back in now. Um, yeah, why is the signal so hot? So the preamp is really doing some work there. Yeah. 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 
but no real hindrance in for the for the technique stuff which is a, such a nice feeling and for those of you who really play slap like not like me who just bullshits my way through it um for the most part it's it's definitely that bass you know and i I've, you know whenever i do have to play slap i always kind of gravitate towards a jazz style bass not a p bass but this one definitely has the vibe of being able to do like a ton of things to get that kind of marcus miller slap thing but also to be a really functioning p bass in a band the classic tracking kind of sound that, uh, that so many of us are looking for when we go to the studio um so yeah uh um let's see what do we got here we've got some Episodes of the uh, of the pedal studio with this. I think it's going to be great using the um, Lusitand. I think I unboxed those in a previous video, so I'm not going to get those out again. The, the compressor and the and the uh, ground and pound, the Alma compressor and the ground and pound from uh, Lusitand. So looking forward to doing that episode with this. I did one episode like a, a lesson video the other day, and um, and it felt great explaining. Uh, what, what was I doing? Um, I was doing the bass line. How to play a bass line and a bit of a melody at the same time. How to groove and, you know, quote unquote, solo at the same time without making the audience stop dancing, without losing the groove, even if the rest of the band drops out around you. That was the last video I put on my on the channel for, for a lesson. If you haven't seen that, go check it out. I'll link it below in the description of this video and um it was yeah it was nice doing that with this bass it's a real because it's a utility bass and it's something i think a lot of people watching and listening can relate to like the four string is the thing right and it's amazing like as i look around me <laughs> like one two of the let's see let's just count the bases in the room one two three four five six seven eight i've got eight bases in my studio and one two three four five uh, four, five, six, six of the eight, seventy-five percent of the instruments in my studio are four strings. Um, some of them have strings that haven't been changed in fifteen years. Uh, there's a jazz bass, there's a P bass, there's a triple P, double P, or quadruple P, maybe uh, we want to call this. Um, there's the six string, which is brand new, and of course my main Madison. But it's like most of my instruments are four string basses. I think. You know, because I'm so known for the five string with the high C and the single cut and all that stuff and the sort of soloist and chordal playing I do with my own music, the like 80% of the rest of my career the, <laughs> where I've actually made money and paid rent and, and you know, had a life has all come from the four string. Um, and maybe that gets a little lost. Not on you guys, I'm sure. The audience, the coffee drinkers, the 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 regular listeners. But I think from a general perspective standpoint, that is like, oh, yeah, that's the guy who plays up the dusty end of the neck with a high C all the time, you know, whatever. I'm not, I'm, I guess I'm not looked at as a, someone who actually owns more four strings than, than anything else. And over the course of my career, have played probably, um, if not more, at least an equal amount of four string to the, to the whole five thing. So, yeah, that's, this is the RKM Custom Base 4 very proud to own it um it's uh, an, an immensely kind um gift from them you know i really hope this is recording well because i've hardly recorded with it at all i definitely haven't done anything like this like the podcast with it and i really hope you're getting as beautiful uh 
an example of it as I am in the room through the amp. It intonates really well, even though the first thing I did with it was butchered the, the action and raised it up like crazy, uh, you know. Anyone who knows me knows that's my scene. I wonder if I can, how I can give you a good look at that in the light. And this is a terrible angle to do it. But, oh, there you go. You can kind of see the daylight, the daylight through the E string <laughs> and the neck there. It's definitely not on the, uh, not on the low side. It's absolutely cranked. But even with the cranked action, and it's not even as high as I want it yet, but even with that cranked action, I still feel pretty loose. It started to make me think, oh, so what would a five string version of this sound like? That would be really interesting with these sort of, uh, I guess, lower profile frets with the maple neck. That, that could be a thing, like a four-string double P, a five-string double P, sorry, that would be an interesting take on it. What would what would it feel like with a 33-inch scale maybe or a 32 even? Um, that would be interesting. How about a zero fret instead of a nut? Those, if I were to customize something or help design something, I think those are the things that I would be thinking about. <laughs> Ah. But I'm still able to fly around it and feel like myself. And I, I hope I, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to doing the mix, the, the, the quote unquote mix on this podcast once I get done. <laughs> to be like, oh, does it actually, is that me? Is that not? You know, who knows? Trying to find an identity this quickly uh, on a new instrument is always a bit of a challenge. But the way it feels in the room, at least. I'm definitely getting that vibe, which is an awesome feeling, as I'm sure you know. And there's always obviously something nice about a new instrument and you find totally different things in it and new stuff and stuff you hadn't expected. But there's also that sort of thing that you want, like you want some consistency through your instruments and you want to sound like yourself uh, as soon as possible, even if there are new... Uh, new angles to that, shall we say, with, with a different instrument. You, I, I, personally, I want to sound like myself right away. And uh, uh, what is that? definitely feel like that is happening here in the room and i'm psyched i'm going to take it to a gig this week if anyone's in la playing with bob reynolds on thursday night at the baked potato i'm going to take it to the gig i really want to feel it in action you know in the field reality versus studio in this very uh conveniently cozy environment but cozy is not really the word we're experiencing sort of a biblical uh storm so for la anyway i'm sure there are seattle's looking down here like yeah whatever guys that's just a monday morning in july for us but uh certain parts of la i read pasadena's getting 10 inches of rain long beach is getting six like or the downtown is getting six inches like certain parts are being evacuated there are mud it's quite crazy and where we live up in the hills i'm just hoping our house sticks to the side of the hill <laughs> through the night because uh, it's really, really coming down out here. And um, yeah, so cozy, maybe not the right word right now. Even finding some of the false harmonics right away, which is really nice. There it is. So I could talk and waffle and play for hours more, but I need to go do that uh, on my own time and not bore you guys and girls with it. Um, yeah, that's it. That's the new bass. Uh, I, I can't believe it's. <laughs> can't believe I said I was selling all my bases and I said I wasn't going to the NAM show. 
I did sell a bunch of bases, but I did end up going to the NAM show and came away with this one. And possibly a few more things on the horizon. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to the design side of things more than ever, I think. And sort of contributing to some instrument projects that are perhaps not signature instruments or perhaps not something that goes into production for years and years and years, but maybe things that are limited runs and something that is, you know, not for everyone, not for the masses, like not trying to make the next P bass that sells 10,000 units over um, 20 years or something, but actually just trying to make something special, uh, something that, I think the most important thing is that it's something I'm going to keep and it's something that I'm going to use. Um, so there really has to be purpose and intent behind the design and the collaboration, which uh, a few of the conversations I had at the NAMM show really gave me some gave me some hope uh, with that. And uh, one last thing, which was super interesting, I got to hang with uh, with Jonas Helborg a little uh, a little bit. Uh, because Caveman Audio and Dogal Strings were sharing a booth, and I went by to see uh, see my buddies at Caveman, and Jonas is working with Dogal Strings and has a like a signature set of strings or something. He was telling me, um, but interestingly, we were discussing, you know, what we like and what we don't like about instrument design, and I was like, I, 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 <laughs> I said, yeah, well, you know, I, I really like to play with the zero fret. And he's like, yeah, me too. I said, yeah, I really like the 32-inch scale. He's like, oh, yeah, me too. And I said, well, I, I really like E to C. He's like, yeah, me too. And I was like, are we playing the same? Are we doing the same thing? But like we don't, we've met a few times over the years, but we are, we're not friends. We don't talk. We don't text. Like ho hopefully maybe that will change now because we apparently have. And, and also I don't like, I, I, I'm ashamed to say I don't follow uh, uh, everything that Jonas Helborg is, is doing as much as a fan of his as I've been over the years and of, of course the stuff with John McLaughlin really like had a massive impact on me as I'm sure it did a, a lot of other people who heard that music and Jonas is playing in general had a, had a massive impact on me again stylistically nothing like what I do now just as the Marcus Miller thing is not what I do now but those guys had huge impacts on me uh, early on in my career and in my development as a musician. So uh, I'm ashamed to say I haven't followed so much of what Jonas has done lately. But it was interesting to see that we uh, have separately arrived at, at a very similar setup in terms of what we dig for our own music. So that, that could be a really interesting maybe podcast interview. I'd love to go to Sweden, out to the countryside where they live and, uh, and do that interview. That would be super fun. Um, I'm also looking at trying the squiggly frets. If you've if you've uh, checked that out, that those out the true temperament frets, you may have seen Henrik Linder has those on his bases. I'm kind of I was always against the idea. I thought it was maybe a little bit hype or just maybe wasn't for me so much. But the more I get into the details, the older I get, the more my music changes and perhaps my writing and writing specifically for the for the bass at certain points and maybe writing some completely solo music there's something that kind of catching my ear a little bit in terms of uh in terms of the of the squealy frets and the tuning and how that kind of affects um you know it affects it affects the setup, affects chords, affects melodies. I was talking to Henrik a little bit about it. We got to hang. He was sitting right there on the couch, actually, just the other day. Um, him and Anders Matheson came over for dinner. It was great to catch up with Anders after all these years. Holy shit, there's so many things happened at NAMM. I didn't even talk about Matheson. And, yeah, played some new instruments that uh, True Temperament are doing, CNC versions of the Matheson basses. So that could be something that's a collaboration that might actually work out in terms of producing some instruments where we failed before. So that was a nice uh, sort of reunion and catch up and, you know, just really good to, to hang. And I was talking to Henrik about the True Temperament fret thing specifically, even though now True Temperament, the company, have CNC machines and are producing basses. I know Henrik has sold a bunch uh, of his pink one, the, the Henrik Linder thing, with the squiggly frets in, and we were just talking about the setup and you know, how maybe that's something I want to try. Um, I definitely want to get, I don't have a fretless anymore and I, I want to get one that's maybe a, a, an exact copy of my Matheson five string with the high C but fretless. That would be very interesting 
and something I think I would just keep forever as a as an option, as a sonic option here and there. Maybe even write a little bit more for it. That's all. That's starting to be what's in the back of my mind. That's probably something I should have tacked on the story about selling the bases. Was that I want to be so focused on the, on the output, on writing and producing and releasing music that. I had a bunch of instruments that weren't a massive part of that. So that's definitely a shift I was trying to make by getting rid of a bunch of instruments. And that is the direction I'm continuing to move in by perhaps taking on uh, a very few new ones over the next year or two. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be super fun. I, of course, love sharing it with you. I can't believe that within two weeks <laughs> I've shared a six string and a new double P. That's crazy. I could not have... If you'd have told me that a month ago, I said, yeah, you're out of your mind. There's no way two bases are coming into my orbit in the next month. And holy crap, they did. They're both awesome. Um, and I'm just really uh, very fortunate. And uh, that's another thing about the not taking the free gear and the free crap for granted, the free stuff that people uh, throw my way sometimes. And I am very fortunate. I, like, I think that every single day I wake up, I go through my morning routine, I find many things to be grateful for. It's a great way to start the day knowing that there are relationships out there, um, personal and business and musical and all of those things that bear really you know, positive and productive fruit, so to speak. Um, and a lot of the questions I get about, well, how do you get this and water endorsements and all of those things, like I can say I'm grateful till I'm blue in the face and I'll mean it always. That's a that's a big part of what I try and be with myself, never mind with you guys, is, is honest. And then there's the other thing of like, yeah, I'm fortunate, but also I work hard. And I think those two things should be really highlighted for anyone who's asking the question of like how do I get to the next step or how do I put myself in that position to maybe be you know thrown some free gear here and there or you know I, th I think the, the, the underneath it underneath it or the foundation is is honesty and is um, just a massive amount of hard work and a huge amount of willpower connected to the love of the work and 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 the love of the music i think that's maybe the, that's the thing i'm most fortunate enough over the overarching uh element of being fortunate is that i love the work and i'm quite happy to get up every single day fancy new bass no fancy new bass doesn't matter i want to get up and do the work every single day i'm transcribing this michael brecker solo right now i've transcribed 100, 150 Michael Brecker solos. I've lost count in my life. I'm 45 years old. I'm not 22. I know it's a minor blues. I know I know all about the guy, about his life, about his music, but I still want to dig a little deeper. I do that with Mike, with 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 Keith Jarrett, with Chick Corea, with Herbie Hancock, with Messian, with uh, Vince Mendoza, you name it. All the people that I love, I just keep going, you know, and there's a an un just an undying willpower to do that every single day no matter whether anyone listens to this podcast or listens to my music or gives a crap about what i have to say that's not the important part the important part is that i truly love what i do and i i i you know the reason i'm saying all this is that i hope Anyone listening who has doubts or who has questions about where they're going or what they should do should find whatever the foundation is. F you should find whatever the foundation is for you. Um, that just happens to be what it is for me. And I try and motivate as many people to to find that. Sometimes it's the same thing and they have the love for the music. Well, great. And then you can build upon that. And then there are processes you can put in place to accelerate your your learning and, and, and get better, quicker and streamline your practice routine and your approach and make sure you, you you play with the right intent and you work with the right intent to get the best results. Um, so I'm always a fan of talking about that stuff. Um, it's great to talk about new instruments, but it's also great to talk about the reality behind it as well and, and how those things come to be. Um, and again, I'm always open to questions. I try and get to every single comment left on every single video. So leave them below if you've got questions on any of this. Um, hit me up. Uh, I'm really, 
I want to be a resource in that sense. I can't answer the dozens and dozens and dozens of emails that come in every week. It's impossible. Like you've got pedal questions, leave pedal questions on a pedal video. Don't send me an email with a random pedal question in it about compression or distortion or signal check. I'm never going to get to it. I simply don't have the time to sit there and write individual emails. But leave me a comment on a video that's about a pedal or compression or fuzz or signal chain. And I'll leave that comment and reply to you because hundreds of people are going to see it, maybe thousands even, and it really it really does some good for everyone involved. So the conversation happens on YouTube comments. Let's try and keep to that. And uh, that's it. Don't forget, these books are back in stock. Signed copies, shipping all over the world. I apologize in advance that I know Pentatonix is going to sell out almost right away if you don't get to it in time. I'm sorry. I apologize. They will be back in stock as soon as they run out, I order more. Um, I just can't, like I said, do massive batches at this time. I don't have that kind of capital. And there are just too many books. I've written 22 books or something like that. So it would like bankrupt me to have a thousand copies or even a hundred copies of each one in stock at all times. I can't sell them that fast. They are selling out, but I can't sell them that fast. So I apologize in advance to people who didn't get one right away. Uh, but there are some in stock as of the filming of this podcast. You guys, you girls, bass players, musicians of the world, are the absolute shit. Love you guys. And uh, that's it. Hope you enjoyed the new the new RKM double P. I'll leave their details in the description link. You can go check out the website. Uh, I'll even link to the to the base page of this actual base so you can go see all the specs of this exact instrument as well. Um, and that's it. I will see you very soon. <laughs>